Well, as I'm just to remind us, uh, tell us what state you're in now in terms of your passport application and, and where you're sitting on it at the moment. Yeah, so uh, myself and my lawyers have just issued a, a pre-action letter to the government uh, asking them to explain uh, why this process that has lasted essentially for the past eight years in which the, my passport was revoked and then returned uh, on September in 2021 and then three weeks later was revoked again um, without any explanation. Um, and the really bizarre, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, thing that happened is that the letter that was addressed to me um, was sent with, alongside a cover letter uh, that was addressed to a person in the north of England in 2017 who was, of all things, convicted for passport fraud. Um, so it gets really bizarre, incompetent, mm. um, but also I think there's a level of vindic vindictiveness. You would see that as a, as a heavy breach of data protection laws as well, wouldn't you? Um, remind us why, I mean, why do you believe this is happening? Uh, I think it's happening because there's a level of uh, incompetence, uh, knee-jerk reaction. Um, I, I have correspondence between myself and my lawyers and the passport office and the home office that lasts a period of eight years. And eight years, the government say they are making checks. Now, it's important that People understand. I was the government attempted to, uh, attempted to prosecute me in 2014 uh, f uh, in relation to a trip to Syria that I'd made, which was uh, given the green light by the police and by the security services, who I both met before I'd left. Um, that prosecution failed. I was declared uh, not guilty, and also the police went above and beyond and said that Mazum is an innocent person. But despite that, my passport has still remained revoked, and so. The fact that it was sent back to me after all this time and that I could finally celebrate, I could go and see my daughter who got married abroad, uh, who I could do a little party for, I could restart my investigations that I've been involved with since my return from Guantanamo, was all um, put to, 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 to bed as a result of this taking my passport away, again, without any, any meaningful explanation. Give us and our viewers a bit of a broader understanding of the whole context behind this. You mentioned you spent some time in Guantanamo Bay. Is this all a hangover and a sort of a, a prejudicial thing from the government in terms of the way they look at you as to why you're not being allowed your passport? And are you a figurehead for hundreds of others potentially who are being denied the same thing? Well, look, uh, yes. I mean. I have been held in three military detention sites without charge or trial where I've been subjected to torture and seen and have seen people tortured to death. This, these facts have been uh, accepted by both the British and the US government, so there's no controversy there. Um, I've been arrested here in the UK by counter-terrorism police three times, and I've had my passport revoked three times. Yet, and this is the shocking part, I've never been convicted of any crime, I've never had my day in court, and I have been declared innocent by the very police that arrested me in 2014 to begin with. So what this tells you is that there's something behind all of this, and that's what we're seeking through the judicial review, that you come clean and say, what is it about yourselves and your relationship with me that has allowed you to do this, to disrupt my life for the past 20 years and still not uh, give me my day in court? So would you say there's some sort of conspiratorial silencing of activists such as yourself going on? Um, well, I don't think it's conspiratorial. I have sat with the Metropolitan Police and given them evidence of uh, MI5 agents uh, who were physically present when I was being tortured in Bagram and Guantanamo. I have uh, given evidence to the International Criminal Court. I have given evidence to a judge-led inquiry that was ordered by David Cameron himself. And I've given evidence at an, at an international war crimes tribunal. Uh, at every stage, our government and the government of the United States of America has managed to escape any uh, um, accountability. And I think it's that and that alone, uh, really, that uh, uh, the government doesn't like. It doesn't like to be held accountable, which is, uh, uh, you know, one, I think something that we can see even now, that uh, accountability of the government, you can say one thing, you can say we're a nation of laws and rules and presumption of innocence, but the reality is that when it comes to the test, um, you just simply fail. Yeah, it's very rare that we can speak to someone that has first-hand insight on what it's like in Guantanamo Bay 20 years on. Uh, tell us what your experience was and how harrowing it must have been. 
Um, well, by the time I was sent to Guantanamo, I spent two years in Guantanamo. Prior to that, I was I held in a place called Bagram, which is a detention facility run by the U.S. in Afghanistan. I'd seen two people murdered by American soldiers. I was subjected to the sounds of a woman screaming in the next cell that I was led to believe was my wife being tortured. And um, so by the time when they sent me to Guantanamo, uh, I was put in a cell uh, that measured eight foot by six foot. There is no natural light. There is no windows, no access to any meaningful communication with family, no phone calls, no lawyers. Um, you're just there and caged. Uh, but one of the amazing things, again, that came out of this was that I built up a friendship with some of those guards, some of the soldiers who guarded me, and some of them have um, amazingly come and visited me in my home and stayed with me and have joined the call to close Guantanamo, Guantanamo and joined the call against torture and arbitrary detention. Tell us a little bit about the work you do now then and why you think the government might still be against you in many ways, despite what you do day to day. Um, so I work for an organization called CAGE, that campaigns for people that have been caught up in the war on terrorism. Um, and I remember when I sat with the former Justice Minister Kenneth Clark um, during a period of time in which the government was forced to accept that it had known that we were being tortured, the former Guantanamo prisoners and we received compensation as a result. But one of the things he said to me at that time in 2010 was that we want to turn over a new page. We don't want to be associated with the, um, with the actions of the past governments. And I took him for his word. But in fact, what was to happen after that um, was just as bad because the, the level of anti-terror legislation that targets people from my community, from the Muslim community, has just gone on exponentially. And whilst I understand that there has been a threat of, of terrorism, which we all re uh, reject, um, we're not all responsible and we shouldn't be all painted with the same brush. With everything going on at the moment, are you worried the man on the street, the general public, just aren't that interested in stories like yours compared to the kind of things that are impacting their daily lives and so that your light that you're shining upon an issue like this is going to go unnoticed? It's quite possible. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that is the case, but I'm still duty bound to try to fight for justice for myself and for those who are around me who have been affected by it. And, uh, it, you know, there was a time when uh, the fight against apartheid and all the other sorts of um, negative laws and, and uh, uh, ideas were not uh, um, popular. Um, but at some point, somebody will, people, people who are reasonable will come around and say, either the law applies to all of us or it doesn't. We can't have a two-tier system where we treat people unequally. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? I do. I always do. I, I would not be doing this work if I didn't. Um, I have a great deal of hope and faith in people, including the people of Britain. Um, I've met a lot of good, decent people at every corner of this country, and uh, they are the ones who give me hope whenever I meet them. Do you still meet a lot of people outside of official institutions that are still suspicious of you? Um, it's mostly behind the screen, so people make comments on visual, uh, social media where you don't actually have to face the person you're talking to. Um, but my experience has been from whether it's the Isle of Wight all the way to um, little villages in Dorset, has been that people, when they listen and hear, they're shocked, they show a great deal of support, they're outraged that governments can get away with this, this type of behaviour, and they're generally supportive because people are generally decent, and that's been my view. Rosam, thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you.